8th May 2024, Power to Witness by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I am Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you tonight. We trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. And may you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can have in your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are in attendance tonight. And even as we speak about you and your work tonight, I pray, O oh God, that you will empower me. You will empower my wife behind the camera. And I pray, O oh Lord, that your word will go forth and bring fruit in due season. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Our reading tonight is taken from the books of, our book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, that's Israel, and to the end of the earth. Our message today is entitled, Power to Witness. Let's talk a few minutes about God's power. Just before he ascended to heaven, Jesus told his disciples, to wait for the imminent outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He promised them power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit was to anoint them with supernatural power, divine power like they had not seen in anyone but Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is the power of God because the Holy Spirit is God. Being the power of God, such power is beyond the comprehension of mere human beings like us. This fact was witnessed in the days of the apostles and even today when inexplicable happenings take place that we collectively term miracles. Anything that we cannot understand within the realm of our understanding, within the laws of physics, or other sciences we term miracles like a person who has fourth stage cancer and is healed overnight we call that a miracle and that is because of the power of the Holy Spirit now the book of Acts records miracles by the Apostles that were similar to those of Jesus Paul raised the person from the dead Peter raised a, a, a woman from the dead. Now the Lord had done that previously. And the Lord had prophesied that his disciples would do greater works than these. Healing, deliverance, the raising of the dead were among the miracles of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. So the power of God was the power of through the Holy Spirit empowerment of his people. Now God the Holy Spirit empowered men to do things beyond mere human, human being capabilities. The Holy Spirit did the miracles through the agency of the disciples. It was Peter's hand that was laid upon the sick. It was Paul's hand that was laid upon the sick. But it was the Holy Spirit who did the healing through them. Now the reason for supernatural power in actions such as miracles, prophetic utterances, and laying down of doctrine is ultimately all for the glory of God and God alone. This book is for the glory of God. The prophetic utterances that you might hear are for the glory of God. The miracles that took place and are taking place are all for the glory of God. So do not be caught praising a man or relying on a man. This power of the Holy Spirit was given in fulfillment of the promise of the Father and Jesus to send the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension. Now God 
equips his servants with his power and his authority to spread the gospel. Miracles are signs to unbelievers of his love and will or willingness to save all mankind. So God gives his servants power. He gives them the authority to use his power. He gave them authority over demons and sicknesses. He gave them authority over infirm people or infirm spirits or spirits of infirmity. They could cast out demons. They could heal the sick. Peter even pronounced judgment on Ananias and his wife Sapphira or Sapphira and they died. You see, this was to show the power of God through these people and by extension the power of God through you and through me in this time. You and I have the same access to the authority and power of the Holy Spirit as promised by the Lord in Matthew chapter 10. Now those who are faithful, who are obedient and willing to work for the Lord are gifted spiritually by the Holy Spirit. God gives you gifts for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God gives you the gifts and if you do not want to use the gift, the gift will lay dormant. If you want to work for the Lord, the Lord will give you gifts to use in his ministry. And that is how your ministry or the preaching of the word in your life to others will be followed by signs and wonders. And when you look into the book of Acts, you find that signs and wonders followed the preaching of the word. I want to dwell a few minutes on our purpose. When Jesus gave this command to say to them, uh, wait in Jerusalem, and then later he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. He was saying to us that we have a purpose. We are not living in this world willy nilly. We are not just going through this world. We are not born to live, to eat, to die and disappear. We are born to worship the Lord and to proclaim his good news as soon as we learn it. Now Jesus' command to his disciples to wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit follows the great commission of Matthew 28, sorry, Matthew 28, 19, uh, 18 and 18 to 20. I always include 18. Okay? Because Jesus said, all power, power is given, all authority is given unto me. Then he gives them that authority and says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay. Now, the great commission when Jesus gave in Matthew 28, he said to his disciples, go and preach the gospel. But previously, he had told them, that I am going to ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit in my name. Because he wanted them to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here Jesus charged his disciples to spread the gospel. And in Acts he builds on the commission or the great commission by telling them to spread the gospel to the world beginning at home and then going out outside their locality nationally and then ultimately internationally. However, he said to them, you must wait because there is power coming, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that is our purpose, to spread the gospel. Those who have come to the light, or who have been drawn to the light by the Lord, are expected to take the message of salvation to those who have not come to the light. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing. Unbelievers come to Jesus by hearing the preaching of the gospel. If they do not hear, how would they know? So that is why the Lord says to us, We must go out and preach. 
Because preaching of the gospel is our main purpose. Now your immediate response tonight may be that you do not have the skills of biblical theological knowledge to be a preacher. You are not a theologian. You are not an orator. Okay, so you do not have the knowledge or the skill to preach. But both of these are not absolute prerequisites to personal evangelism. Deep theological knowledge or grand oratorial skills are not necessary to be an effective witness to the Lord. You don't have to know this book in and out. You don't have to know every last thing about this. You don't need to know the Greek or the, or the Aramaic or the Hebrew. You don't need to know uh, every last bit of the Bible in detail. You do not know, need to know the history of the Bible, the geography. As long as you understand the Lord, neither do you need grand oratorial skills, the ability to speak in public to thousands of people. These are not necessary to be an effective witness for the Lord. Remember Moses. Moses, when God called him to, to go and speak his word, Moses said, I can't speak. Send somebody else. There's a lot of people who can speak, not me. Peter was a fisherman. Peter was a vulgar, rude fisherman, but yet God chose him to preach. And in one sermon, he saved 3,000 people. You see, you don't need to know this. There's an old saying, it's old now, that God does not call the qualified, but he, he qualifies the called. Okay, you can debate that. But God does qualify you when you are called. He empowers you, is what they mean to say. All that is necessary... To be a personal evangelist, that means to be able to speak to a person and to witness to them, is the willingness to witness. If you are willing to witness, God will give you the boldness, God will give you the opportunity. God will supply the words, God will supply the knowledge. If one knows Jesus personally, one has a testimony. All you need is to know the Lord and you have a testimony. Whoever you are, if you know Jesus, you have a testimony. One needs only to tell others one's own experiences with the Lord. I can talk to you for days about what the Lord means to me or what He has done for me, how I experienced Him and how my life has changed. Just relating what Jesus has done for you or how your life has changed and what knowing Jesus means to you is enough of a witness. Because the Holy Spirit, not only does He give you the boldness to speak, He also does the job of convicting and converting. You can speak to somebody about the Lord till you're blue in the face, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to them in their hearts, they will not come to an understanding of the Lord Jesus. Now let's go back to the early disciples. They, they publicly proclaimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now this was something that was difficult to do in those days because remember the high priests, the Roman officials, and all these people chose to disbelieve and they chose to Change the narrative of Jesus' resurrection. To them, they knew that, some, that Jesus' body was gone. They heard the rumors that Jesus had been seen by so many people. But they wanted to quell the narrative. They wanted to control the news. Okay? They wanted to control the news. And if you spoke about Jesus, it opened you up to potential persecution and possible prosecution. But these early disciples openly, publicly proclaimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. To a person that didn't know, it might have sounded a foolish thought to say that somebody was killed by the Romans and he rose from the grave. They also proclaimed that he was God. They went around saying that he is God. That he is the Messiah that was foretold. And again, 
remember that the Roman, I mean, sorry, the, 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 the Jewish synagogue, Sanhedrin, the chief priests and elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they hated this <clears throat> because according to them, Jesus could not be the Messiah. And then these early disciples also proclaimed that salvation or forgiveness of sins could only be found in Jesus alone. Now, let's fast forward to the 21st century. Here we have these people in the 1st century who are so bravely, pro bravely proclaiming the Lord publicly even though they face persecution. Now, 20 centuries later, here we are in the 21st century, 2024. Many are unafraid to proclaim the gospel. Yes, we have many people who are not afraid to proclaim the gospel like me. But many more prefer to remain silent. They, rem they prefer to remain silent for political correct correctness, for social, so that they don't upset the social uh, the fabric of society. They want to be politically correct, socially correct. They do not want to upset anybody. They don't want to draw criticism because they don't want to defend this word. And this is the bane of modern Christianity. This is the point or the saw in the body of Christ, the, the church. Christian evangelism in, in latter times has given way to personal motives. In many cases, people come to church and not to Christ. I have heard people saying to others, come to church, come, come to church. Very seldom have I heard people tell somebody, come to Jesus. The mission is not to grow the church, but to grow one's wealth. I'm talking about the postmodern church. The church as it is now, when I look around us, I see if I had to look at the church, many churches from the outside looking in, I will say that the mission from their actions and their preaching, that their mission is not to grow the church with souls, but to grow individual and corporate wealth. Those professing faith in Jesus Christ have to, must revisit their motives for being a Christian. Are you here to please yourself or to please the Lord Jesus Christ? My answer is found in the book of Joshua, where Joshua said, as for me, he said, choose ye this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. As I close, I speak about the harvest in the next few minutes. When Jesus spoke to his disciples and told them about proclaiming the gospel after the Holy Spirit has come upon them, he was talking about a harvest and he'd spoken previously as well about a harvest. And I'll come to that. Now, Peter's first sermon at Pentecost. Now, here's a man who didn't really preach. What he did was listen to Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He was subservient to Jesus. He discussed with Jesus, asked him questions. He did a little bit of preaching when Jesus sent them out two by two. And when they came back and they were so excited that demons were, were running away at the sound of their voice when they said the name of Jesus. But Peter was an untrained orator. He'd never spoken in public before. I don't see anywhere else he'd spoken in public. Peter was untrained. We don't know how much of schooling he had. I, I, I would dare say that he had schooling because he was a businessman. Regardless of the fact that he was a, a, a fisherman, he had schooling. He had some sort of schooling. And I, and I reckon that he could speak the Greek language, which was the business language of the time. Because the Old Testament, our New Testament was written mainly in Greek. Now, Peter's first sermon, this, this uh, relatively uneducated person, relatively untrained person, spoke at his first sermon or spoke his first sermon at Pentecost and 3,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus. 
These are 3,000 people who had never heard the gospel before. Because when you read through Acts 2, you find there were people from other countries there, other, uh, other areas and regions, and 3,000 gave their hearts to the Lord. Now, when last did you hear of such a great rate of conversion? When last did you hear of a conversion where 200 people gave their hearts to the Lord one time? Now, the agent that empowered Peter, that brought about conviction, that brought about conversion, that brought about change and commitment in these in new converts was the Holy Spirit. It was not Peter's sermon or Peter's words. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through the agency of, P of Peter. It was the Holy Spirit who spoke into the hearts and minds of those through the various tongues that were being spoken then and later through Peter's sermon and 3,000 people saw the miraculous uh, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking of tongues and then they heard Peter's sermon and they gave their hearts to the Lord. Now isn't it time that we returned to such great Holy Spirit led revivals? We need Holy Spirit led revivals, not man centered pseudo revivals. Now Jesus in Acts 1 8 mandated a threefold harvest field of souls. He mentioned to us in his mandate that we should go out and preach the gospel specifically three areas and this was a metaphor that he used he said in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria which made up Israel at the time and to the end of the earth an orderly progression of the gospel one step at a time one soul at a time one region at a time first locally then nationally and finally internationally that is how jesus saw it jesus believed that charity or that uh, soul uh, 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 sorry uh, soul winning or witnessing for jesus is just like charity begins at home start with those people that are closely related to you that are around you then progress in ever widening circles another way to look at it is and I've said it to you first your family then your relatives your neighbors and finally strangers now in Matthew 9 37 38 Jesus said and I alluded to this early on the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, into his harvest. Jesus was saying to us that as much as the harvest is plentiful, he knows, and it is universally, eternally almost true, that the laborers are few or too few. And he said to us that part of our prayer must be to pray to God the Father, the Lord of the harvest, to send laborers into his harvest to raise up men and women who are prepared to witness for the Lord not necessarily not necessarily speaking to hundreds of people or preaching in a church which is seems to be the norm everybody wants to preach in church because you are preaching to the choir you are preaching to the converted nobody's going to criticize what you're saying nobody's going to take you up on an offer and uh, to 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 debate something we have been given or God given. We have the God given opportunity to answer Jesus prayer call. Not only might we have the opportunity and the and the means to pray in that regard. We also have the opportunity to answer the Lord's prayer by volunteering for duty and becoming a witness for the Lord. So tonight I want to adjure you by the mercies of God volunteer for duty. Become a witness for the Lord. Now the number of Christians, and I, and I want to talk about the harvest, the worldwide harvest. The number of Christians in total is 2.4 billion. This is made up, 50% of that is Catholic, and just under 37% of that is Protestant. 
But that total, that total 2.4 billion Christians. Now these are, these are not uh, Bible punching, uh, you know, uh, Bible believing, true Christians, born again, blood washed. This is a number for those who call themselves Christians. 2.4 billion. That is only 30% of the world's population of 80, uh, sorry, of 8 billion, which means there are 70% 70, 70 of the world, of 5.6 uh, billion people in the world, do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And when you break that 2.4 billion down, only 0.9 billion, less than a billion, are Protestant Christians like you and me. Now that is a sad indictment of the church. When there's 8 billion people and only 2.5 billion or 2.4 billion are Christian. And out of that 2.4 billion, we don't know what percentage are born again Christians. Jesus was right 2,000 years ago when he said there were too few laborers. For a big harvest. And it is true today. But still the church dithers. Pastors think it is enough to go preach on a Sunday. To have somebody preach. On, uh, to have a prayer meeting on a Tuesday. Have a cell meeting in various areas. Have cell leaders who preach there uh, on, on a Thursday. And have a uh, youth or young people's church on a, on, on, on a Saturday. And then on a, a Sunday, have a Sunday school and a divine service. It's more than that. It is about mobilizing the church, mobilizing Christians to reach one other person. If every one of this 2.4 billion Christians in one year, each one brought another Christian to the Lord. Okay, let's just go and say 1 billion. Forget about 2.4. Let's say 1.4. Those are children. And plus those who are not really saved. Let's say there's one billion truly saved. If the one billion bring one each, we'll have two billion people saved in one year. Another billion. So we'll have two billion Christians at the end of the first year. At the end of the second year, you'll have four billion Christians. And exponentially, the world can be saved. And that is what happened during the time of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles or more appropriately the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The world needs a savior. It just does not know it. We are the ones to tell the world you need a Lord. While believers were trying to use Jesus and are trying to use Jesus for personal gain, the enemy was not idle and is not idle. Most people nowadays, and I can stand upon what I'm saying because I've, I've seen it and I believe it. Many, many people, most people, I'd say, go to church for the wrong reason. They go to church for self-interest and not for the interests of the Lord. So what did the enemy do? How did he beat, beat us? How did he beat the church? He introduced carnal pursuits, various things that took you away from the Lord, that gave you pleasure other than reading the Bible and communing with, uh, with the Lord. And he invented... For the, religion, for the religious people who believe they should have some sort of religion, he introduced pseudo or invented pseudo spiritual substitute religion. He created other practices that would take you away from the true and living God. And the result is a world that is critical of Christianity and antagonistic toward Jesus. If you are a Christian, you'll know this, especially if you're a born-again believer. The world has no truck. They have no problem with any other religion except Judaism and Christianity. Just those two. Just Judaism and Christianity. They have no problem with any other religion. Even when those religions go out and do abominable things. It is, they will cover up for them. But if a Christian had to do one thing wrong, 
you are in big trouble. Because the world is anti-Christian, anti-Christ. Nevertheless, we must not be deterred. As we, if we are deterred, we will be conceding victory to Satan. We must all the more earnestly proclaim the truth of sin and the way to salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Now think about this. It would be selfish of you to know the Lord, yet deny others the same pleasure of a relationship when they need it just as badly as you did. The bottom line tonight, the Lord God in his wisdom does not require us to go into battle unprepared or ill-equipped. He doesn't expect us to, be, to go witness for him without a knowledge, without uh, uh, any armory. He gave us the Holy Spirit, who is God. Therefore, God, the Holy Spirit, came to live with us and in us. God, the Holy Spirit, emboldens you and me to proclaim the gospel, even to a hostile audience. Please the Lord tonight, be his witness. We trust you've enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share with your friends and family. Remember, we live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.